Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with me. Before going any further, uh, I'm operating on my laptop, so just need to verify good audio evening, is everybody. good with you guys. Just make sure audio is good. If, some, if you guys can give me thumbs up to make sure everything sounds okay, then we will proceed. Hope everybody's having a good night. It is really a beautiful day here in the North Georgia area. It's just, it was uh, beautiful. It was hot. Uh, pollen was thick. But again, I want to confirm that you guys can hear me okay. I'm not using my normal audio setup. I'm running on AirPods tonight. So, let's see here. All right, good. We got good, good, good. <clears throat> All right. So, you know, I've been getting uh, a message. I've been kind of going back and forth with one of our members on our, our in our group. And she has made some really compelling points. Uh, Doug asked, is this approved message? Oh, uh, haven't given that any thought, Doug. Approved by who? Um, the Lord Almighty? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't, I don't see an issue with it. You know, I, I really try to stick uh, everything uh, and keep it based off uh, scripture in my relationship with him. Uh, that's important to me. Or maybe you're just joking. Either way, no biggie. <laughs> um, let's see here. So I'm going to cut to this, my notes real quick. Go over a few of the things that I was uh, looking at today before I go into what I was referencing. So watching some of the uh, the news they have found some monoliths all over the world, 16 of them to be exact. These are eight feet tall, two feet wide, steel, yeah, maybe not steel, but looks like steel, um, a, a metal, like a completely shiny, almost mirror-like monolith. And they found them in 16 remote locations. Uh, the one recently discovered, a man was jogging through the mountains and came across this monolith. What is interesting is that these things are pretty good size. Like I said, eight feet tall. They estimate that they are a few tons in weight. But there's no tracks or no sign of vehicle tracks or any method to deliver them. So I'm left scratching my head. How would these get to where they are? Not just one, but 16 in all remote locations all over the world. The jogger said he was jogging in an area that he jogs at every week. And this structure wasn't there last week. Um, I'm going to put a picture of it and a link to this news article in the description when I'm done. This is not something you would accidentally miss. It is, it looks, uh, the best way to, yeah, a monolith, you know, is a, a four-sided, it's very tall, skinny. So it kind of looks like, uh, it's hard to explain. I should have had a picture ready, but it's interesting. The material does not look like anything I've ever seen. It's very mirror-like. So where would these things come from if there's no tracks? If, I, I don't get it. And it's, it's really got me curious. Let's see. The monkeys found a monolith in 2001, Space Odyssey. <laughs> All right. Um, so I've been puzzled and very curious about this. On a serious note, where would these monoliths literally come from? They are very unique looking. They, they couldn't have been assembled there because when you see the photo, you'll see that it is one piece, no seams, um, mirror-like reflected uh, material. And there's no tracks of its being delivered there. Some of these are in thick brush. 
that if you were to deliver it, you would have to really, it would be noticeable that you brought it out. So how did they get there? Especially in one of them, he knows that it was not there a week ago. It's just, huh. You know, I'm going to let you guys speculate for a second because I'm scratching my head. So, that being said, another piece of information that I came across today, as you know, they're using that P. Diddy story, what it seems is some type of distraction for something. But it turns out that our current administration, the VP, got her start with him. There's a lot, a lot of videos and security footage of her personally attending as his arm candy for several years in the late 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, being uh, a guest with him at a lot of these upscale parties, even at his home. That's somewhat concerning, seeing how what they are tying his name to. What I don't understand is they have really spelled out some really cut and dry uh, circumstances to our current leaders that are associated with some extremely uh, shady shenanigans that if the tables were turned and our previous administration was in office and anything remotely like any of these cases were to surface, they would have crucified that guy, literally crucified him on television. And you guys understand what I'm saying. So it leaves me wondering, what is it? What, what is it that, you know, half of the American people can just turn a blind eye to so many things that are clearly a a vagrant violation of constitutional rights, of, of legalities, and some of them borderline on treason. But yet, it's not a big deal. No one's calling him out for, you know, the mass deception. So again, I'm left scratching my head. Yeah, Leah said it best. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, she's right. The, the Bible tells us that, you know, good becomes bad, bad becomes good. That's how they associate everything. It, but it's still difficult to literally watch it play out in real time. Because the things that they are doing almost on a daily basis, everyone can see what's going on and see that the it's clearly not acceptable, but everybody's good with it. Everybody's good with it. Everybody, just like the guest that we had on the show the other night, um, Shane, you know, he was a security agent in Texas and the, the federales that are there are instructing all the local enforcement to essentially cut loose anyone that comes across the border that breaks the law. But if you're a citizen, and you break the law, you'll go to jail. Which brings me to my next point. I, I watched a, uh, someone sent me a TikTok video. And it was one of uh, the newcomers into our country. And he was waving a big stack of cash, mocking the American citizens, saying, you guys are slaves. Every one of you are slaves. You're working your tailbone off for this cash that they are giving to us and you got none of it, but all of us have it, but you guys don't. And I sit there and I scratched my head for a second. I'm like, he's right. But what do you do about that? You, you can't really do anything except just accept it. And it's another one of those cases where you're left again, scratching your head, thinking WTF. What is going on? And everybody is completely good with this. So, you know, it's one of those things that you really just have to go to the Lord about it. And 
see where he leads you. But I know when I do, it's going to be one of those big does, you know, because the, the scripture clearly tells us how it goes down. We have an advantage over most because we have the playbook. We literally have the playbook on how it's supposed to go down. So, you know, in a nutshell, me sitting here speculating over this stuff is kind of a big duh just because it point blank says what's going to go down. But nevertheless, you know, it, it does leave you perplexed, especially because so many, uh, you know, it, it, at least the mainstream media passes it as business as usual. Yeah. So let's see here. Yeah. And Leah, she nailed it again. These are all things that need to happen before he returns. I know. It's just, even though I know the obvious, I can't help but to get slightly frustrated. Granted, Getting frustrated is not going to solve anything, but maybe sometimes you just need an outlet to voice your frustration. So folks just like Leah can put me in check and remind me that this is all part of the plan. But it again, you can't help but to be frustrated. <sighs> so it, it, especially, you know, I will say, a lot of families, including my own, I work an enormous amount of time to provide for my four kids, which I'm good with. But they're providing for folks that are not the citizens of the country. I, you know, you would think that it would be common sense that you take care of the people in the homeland first before you take care of outsiders. And again, I'm not talking about not loving them. If they don't have shelter, of course, we provide them with shelter. If they're hungry, of course, we feed them. But it would almost be like, my kids don't have any food or my kids need new shoes, but yet I'm going to go to the neighbor's house and feed their kids first and buy new shoes for the neighbor before I take care of mine. Not sure if that analogy is relevant, but in my mind, that's kind of how it, it, I think about it. But, you know, again, nevertheless, it is reality. And just like she said, I mean, it, all these things have to come to pass uh, before the end comes. So, you know, a hot topic that I see, everybody, I mean, everybody is talking about the eclipse. You, you can't. You can't go anywhere and not hear someone talking about it. You can't turn on any type of streaming service and they're not talking about it. What I did hear on the radio earlier today when I had this thing, oh, it's still fired up, is I heard some FEMA warnings and they were telling folks in the, in the path, Texas and a few other areas, that they need to be prepped with at least three days of food and water at the minimum. So, you know, again, I'm left asking myself, why is that? Is it because there's going to be so many people coming into these areas to watch the eclipse where the stores maybe will get sold out? I'm hoping that's their reasoning that, you know, they're expecting a large influx in people and folks need to make sure they have all their essentials just in case there's an influx and they can't provide for everybody. And then B, there's always the alternative. Is it another case of predictive programming? And again, it's just something you really need to take to the Lord. But speaking of that, you know, it's pretty clear that there's signs and wonders in the heaven that, that we are given to know before major prophetic events happen. And I don't think I've seen signs of this nature in quite some time. Not sure what to really make of it because I'm also being mindful that the deception is going to be extremely thick going forward. And everybody needs to keep that in mind as well is that 
everything needs to be double verified against scripture and everything you need to take to the Lord. It doesn't matter if it's me telling you or whatever the case is. You really need to take everything to the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to to share with each other what we know, what we question. And, you know, we need to pray and take it to the Holy Spirit, even if we're doing it together. The communities such as ours, even if we're electronically connected and not physically in the same place, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling with us, especially in our group. We have such a loving community that are very clear with, you know, our goals of serving our Lord and that having that personal relationship with him really is the key. So, you know, we need to pray and just kind of take it to the Lord and see what he says. But the signs are pretty abundant. The question is, you know, what's going to happen? I'm hoping that nothing happens. I'm good with nothing happening. But I can't help but wonder. And it's interesting that CERN is firing back up on the 8th as well. That is interesting. So you, your mind's left wondering. What do you guys think? And what you guys uh, answer me in the chat. I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts about what's going on. Let's see. Just wait till the gas stations are out of gas. Yeah. So oh, that's a good uh, a good reminder, guys. Make sure your vehicles have full tanks of gas seriously don't be that guy that you're driving around an eighth of a tank of gas you know i have friends that do that they will literally put you know an eighth of a tank of gas in their car and that's as much as they'll put in and then when they get out of gas again they'll stop and get another eighth of a tank don't do it this time and my friends that know who i'm talking about come on man just fill up your gas tank this time especially. It, it, you know, frankly, it probably couldn't hurt to have a few cans of extra gas just in case. I know in the back of my dually, I have four or five extra canisters of fuel. And I've always done that regardless of the situation because you just never know. And when you do that, at any auto parts store, you can buy a little bottle of what's called Stable. It's like S-T-A-B-I-L or something. It will treat the gas and it will allow it to really be stagnant for quite some time. Um, my generator, uh, one of my generators in the shop, you know, I turn it on let it, and fire it up maybe once a month just to let it stretch its legs. But it's had the same gas in it for like three years now. And it always fires up. And it's treated with the, the stable stuff. So I feel like it's important that you go down the list of just some common sense items. Granted, hopefully nothing happens. But it's best to prepare for something that will than to be just like caught off guard and trying to react to the situation after the fact. You don't want to be that person standing in line at a gas station. If for some reason something does happen, the public is textbook known for A, clearing out the toilet paper in the Walmart, clearing out the milk, clearing out the bottles of water, and rushing the gas stations. So we don't want to be those folks. That's going to just contribute to chaos. So make sure you definitely have enough toilet paper it, bottles of water is a given. Look, you can go to Walmart and get a massive can, uh, a massive like 24 pack of water for like $3.50. Every time I go, I make it a habit to buy one of those cases. It, I slowly add to our stockpile that we keep off location somewhere else. It, it just, it can't hurt to slowly add to it. You don't have to spend a ton of money. I just make it a habit every time I go, I spend, you know, 10 to $20. You know, the canned goods that are there, you can literally get the Sam's Club canned goods for some of them are 70 cents a can. Um, some of them are as high as 90 cents, but still, 
that gives you like 10 cans of something plus uh, a case of water every time you go, maybe a bag of rice. And if you do that over time, it actually starts to build up. You just have to create that habit. It's like going to the gym every day, regardless of the excuses. For me, I go to the gym no matter what. doesn't matter what it is. I'm there because I'm that type of person. Once I break that habit, I break that habit, it's, it, it can be detrimental, at least to my uh, workout program. So habit for me is important. And, you know, of course, have your personal relationship with Christ. But that's that's a given in our group. But you still need to be prepared. You don't want to be that guy trying to figure out what you need to do in the event of something that happens. And I've just given you guys some just basic information. But you'd be surprised how many folks are ignoring some of these simple, you know, simple items. Don't be that guy. Also, we've talked about ham radio many, many, many times on this show. If anyone needs help setting up the radio, I'm hoping a a large majority of you have uh, been on our social site and gone to the ham radio section. I've listed many different radios that you can buy, the antennas that I recommend. These are all relatively simple. You can get some. They're not too crazy expensive. But these run off 12-volt batteries, and this will give you comms really anywhere if it's, if it's set up correctly. Uh, a lot of my friends often will say, hey, well, we got satellite phones. Okay, who are you going to call with your sat phone? Who are you going to call? Uh, you know, who do you know that will, will have a satellite phone? I know a few people, but, you know, I don't have their phone numbers Memorized. I guess I could write them down, but who are you going to call? So ask yourself uh, the purpose of that, because those things are relatively expensive. And if the cause of our communications down is not by nefarious actions, but because of something with the sun, those things won't work either, because those things are satellite dependent. So it's important that you know you just have some check boxes. You don't want to be left in the dark when it comes to understanding what's going on. And the reason I feel like that's important is it's, it's, it's almost a psyops. If you remember that movie that everybody is aware of, that uh, Leave the World Behind movie, no one in that, um, at least what they showed, and there was none of them knew, had any way to communicate with anybody. Uh, they literally drove around, went to their neighbor's house, and tried to leave the area, but they couldn't because of a, a, a car jam or, you know, Tesla's went rogue or whatever. But they were totally in the dark on information. And just that fact alone, you could see how it impacted them psychologically. Not knowing can be more detrimental to your mental health than knowing. Because your mind will automatically wander to the worst case scenario of what's going on. So I can't stress this topic enough that being able to collect data and information will be really, really important if something does happen. And I hate that we even have to talk about this. But the reality of it is, is the probability seems higher and higher that something may happen. I mean, they keep planting seeds. You know, the seed planting is overwhelming. And I can't help but notice also that movie that I was referencing. Several things that happened in that movie have now happened. That barge that was hacked, that ended up shipwrecked on the beach. It's looking more and more that was the case with that bridge accident. There's been a couple cases where social media uh, went down. I think one of the times um, Facebook was down for literally like seven hours. You know, there was another time where AT&T was down almost an entire day out of the blue, which was totally weird. Um, 
So it's best to prepare. And I, and again, I hate that we even have to talk about this, but they've been giving us signs that something is coming. And I'm not big into fear mongering, but they keep giving us signs. And you have to, unfortunately, you have to pay attention to them. I understand you're not to live in fear, and I don't recommend living in fear. And it is definitely important that you put your faith and your comfort in Christ because he will be there to help you through your times of trouble. But what he does not say is just to put it all on him and just kick back on your easy chair and not do anything. That's not how it goes. Some people um, misinterpret that where they don't have to do anything. They don't have to prepare. They don't have to do any work for it. That's not really how he works. He expects you to make an effort on many, many things, and he will assist you with your efforts. You know, a lot of the time when you really have that close relationship with him and you're planning and prepping and organizing, when you really have him working with you on your side, you'll find that when you're doing these tasks, that you're accomplishing them much easier than you thought they would. And then there's times where maybe your relationship is not that tight with him. And these tasks that should be easy, you're just hitting roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. That's the Holy Spirit. I know you guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes things are just so easy that they're almost too easy. That is the Spirit working in your favor. And some folks may not believe this, but I I believe it. I definitely think there is a spiritual element to just about everything in life. So you want God's favor. I'm not sure if you guys understand what I mean, but I truly believe there's folks that have God's favor, and then there's folks that literally are cursed. And that happens to countries, people against his people. You know what I mean? Let's see what you guys have to say on this. Jennifer says, moving to Colorado from Arizona. Colorado, that's a great place. George says, just don't believe it. You know it. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that you can say you believe it, but you literally have to believe it in your heart. You know, sort of how your faith in Christ You have to believe it in your soul and have that personal relationship. I I talk to some folks that will, you know, they'll tell me they're really struggling with their personal relationship with him. And I can tell when I, you know, try to help them that I'm not sure if they truly believe what they're saying. That can make a difference. Believing with all your heart and having that love and compassion for what you believe in will make a difference. Because if you're doubting yourself or doubting your beliefs, he knows that. You know, he can read your mind. Now, there's a difference from having your doubts because Satan's messing with your head about wondering if you're saved or whatnot. That that happens to everybody. But as far as your beliefs, your core beliefs and how you feel about the truth when it comes to Christ and the Bible, that you have to have straight. And that is all about building your relationship with Christ. And if folks need more help or better explanation for that, that's something that we can talk to, talk about another time. Let's see here. Shipley. Tell him to go back. (laughs) So Daniel that was on the show the other night that wrote that book, he's going to join us for a little bit. He's going to tell some of his stories that he had. I really was intrigued by him. I'm not sure if you guys remember he wrote that uh, that book, uh, Time is Running Out. He's a very interesting guy. We've been talking a good bunch. He's going to come on. Uh, should be coming on any second. And we are going to talk. Let 
make sure I get this ready for him. There we go. We're going to chat. And if you guys have questions, ask them. If you guys have questions for me, ask them. This is a very informal uh, stream tonight. I, I really didn't put any thought into it. I just wanted to get live with you guys because, A, it's a special day. And, B, you know, there's a lot going on. It's almost like if you skip a day, you feel like a week has gone by with information. Uh, the, the pace that things are moving is really incredible. Another thing that I... Hey, there he is. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Hey. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm good. Glad you could join us. Well, I'm glad to be here. Well, fantastic. We were just, um, I was just randomly talking. You know, um, I really didn't have a plan tonight. I just wanted to come on and, you know, really I like being with the community. You know, uh, so much happens now in a 24-hour period that it can be hard to keep up with everything. It really can. Okay. You know, I saw them talking about a law today that has already, this is already done. The, the federal government has already set up a special division in the three-letter agency where they are, can identify certain folks that have the Second Amendment right that has the bang-bangs. And if you're considered a threat, they can revoke your right to own anything related to the Second Amendment. And it's them that determines who's the threat. Did anybody else see this law that was passed in the special division that they've set up? It's called the ERCO uh, Act or something. I'll have to verify the name of it. RICO, ERCO, something of that nature. But this is brand new, something that they passed, Daniel, that essentially gives them Nazi Germany-style control. It, it's kind of a backdoor loophole, meaning if we want a certain group of people to be able to maintain their means of protection, that's fine. But you can already see the direction that they're going as far as who they label this way. Because I hear the current administration constantly talking about how the MAGA groups, the MAGA groups are a domestic terrorist threat. They, they talk about it all the time. So they have literally been planting the seeds on the ones that they're going to plan on stripping the Second Amendment from. Yeah, look, I mean, stages are being set that we are going to get ready to enter the end times. And I believe yeah. stages are being set to go after Christians, too. You know, right now, living in America, you know, the pushback for Christians isn't that hard or isn't that great but it's going to get very, very difficult. Oh, 100%. You, you, you said it. You said it perfectly. They are planting the seeds for their dictatorship rule. You can see it. Everything's, you know, it's like a chessboard. They haven't made any moves yet to take out any of the players, but they got their rook and their knight and their bishop all in the right place. For when everything goes into motion, it's boom, 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 boom. They're, they're yeah. positioning themselves very strategically. And all you know, I can hope for is that we really do have someone on the good side of things. You know, I know I've speculated about our previous administration being questionable as far as their intention. But I really hope that I'm wrong on that. I really hope that our previous administration is lining up a plan to counteract their plan. 
I, this is one thing I hope I'm wrong on because I personally like, I personally like the previous administration. I'm just, <laughs> I'm being cautious because of red flags. But again, I hope I'm wrong. And I hope our previous administration that says they are for the good team really are for the good team. And they have plans in place to counteract and react to our current administration's uh, nefarious plans. Does that make sense, Daniel? That makes sense. But, you know, you also got to remember, I mean, if we are entering the end times, nobody's going to change that. That's part of God's plan. It's his timeline. We have to learn how to deal with what's coming. And, yeah. you know, I share. I share a great story in my book. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to share it with you. Absolutely. Viewers. Absolutely. I'd love to hear so, your story. Okay. So, uh, and I've got a lot of stories in my book, but, uh, uh this, this but, hey, but before, story, before you, st- before you start, I'm going to set up, um, uh, a, a, a soul screen for you. One second. I'm going to set up. One second. There you go. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Just because I'm going to grab coffee, I can hear what you're saying. So okay. uh, I'm going to grab – I'll only be a minute. I'm going to check on my daughter and grab coffee, but I'm going to be listening to what you're saying because you're in my ear. Okay. So anyway, when I was about uh, 11 years old, 10 or 11 years old, my mother dropped me and my two older brothers and one of their friends off in front of Tiger Stadium to watch a Tiger game, and she told us where to meet her after the game. And as we entered the baseball stadium, you know, me and my older brother, Sam, uh, bought a couple of programs. It was a guy selling programs. We each bought one and we took it up to our seats. Now, my parents didn't come from a wealthy family, so we could only afford the uh, seats at the very top. But I'll tell you, Christopher, as a child, when you walk out into a baseball stadium and see that field for the first time, it's a magical moment. And it was one of the happiest days of my life up until that point. And anyway, I'm sitting there with my brothers and one of their friends, and I'm just going through the program, just admiring the program. And just, it, it, I held it like gold. So we watched the game. At the end of the game, we wanted to hurry up and get out of the stadium, you know, to meet my mother. And we hurried to the, to the, to the, what do you call them? The, the ramps, you know, this is the old right. Tiger Stadium where the ramps that went back and forth for everybody to come down. So we get on the ramp, we're coming down with people and when we get to the next level, there's a ton of people coming on the ramps also. And it kind of felt like cattle. I mean, these ramps were just crowded with people. And about halfway down, I grabbed my brother's arm and I say, I told him, I forgot my program. And he could see by the look on my face that, you know, I was broken. And so he reassured me that we'd go back to our seats and get the program. So we turn around and he tells me to hold on to the back of his shirt as tight as I can. So the three of them walked in front of me and I walked behind them. In my book, the reason I share this story is because, you know, we are going to be pushed back. What's coming is going to be very difficult for Christians. And we need to get with other Christians to make it easier because we're going to be going against the flow. What made it easy for me to go up that ramp where a ton of people were coming down is I had three people in front of me and what made it easy for them is they were all walking together. But if any of us tried to do it alone, it would have been very, very difficult, but it made it easy because I had my brothers with me. And I share that because we are going to need to be with other Christians when things get really bad. I mean, we're not going to be able to do it alone. A hundred percent. That, that, that's actually a very, really good story with a great analogy to explain the importance of your community. Because if you try to solo Mio this, I don't think it'll work out in your favor. You're going to need your community. Everybody's going to have a role because 
we will have to band together and, you know, and wait for our Lord to return. And it's just yeah. the reality of it. You know, if it was just me, I would be good um, getting taken out of the game early. It, w- it wouldn't it wouldn't be really something I would consider, but it's not a bother. But for me, I have little souls that depend on me that I want to yeah. protect protect them from fear. So that's my motivation for everything that I do. Again, if it was just me, I wouldn't even be really wouldn't even be stressed about it because it would just be what it is, what it is. Um, yeah, but when you're a parent and maybe some of you guys are not parents, but if you are a parent, your love and protection for your child, you can't put into words. You just, you just can't. So you really go to the extreme to keep them safe. Oh yeah. I mean, I have a six year old daughter and she really? means the world to me. Yes. Yeah, and I am sixty and I am sixty three years old. So I figured if Abraham can do it at a hundred, I can definitely do it. <laughs> That's awesome, and, and you're right. Um, my youngest is seven, so um, especially when they're little girls. I have two boys and two girls. Don't get me wrong; I love my kids all the same, but there's something very special about a daddy's girl. Oh yeah. Um, it's, it's difficult to put it into words, but you will protect those little girls at all costs. Uh, it's, I will literally go scorched earth if someone tries to hurt my girls. So that's the reason I do everything that I do. Again, if it was just me, I, I, I probably wouldn't even be talking about this. I'd just be happy that the Lord's coming soon and, if I get taken out of the game, I'm just joining him sooner than that. But it's about these little souls that I have to protect. And that is the reason I do everything that I do. I'm not sure if that makes sense to you guys, but that's just, that's my logic. Well, once you become a parent, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It does. Um, you said you had a couple stories. I'd love to hear some more of your stories because, man, that was a great analogy, that story right there. Yeah, you know, yesterday we talked about why I wrote the book, and, uh, you know, I kind of didn't finish up on that, but I'd like to share a story that I tell in my book, uh, a Christmas story that kind of ties in with yesterday and why I wrote the book. So, when I was about eight years old, and I'm pretty sure it was eight, I, I, that's what I put in my book, but it could have been seven. But anyway, I was struggling with the whole Santa Claus thing. You know, some of the kids at school were talking about how there was no Santa Claus. I was kind of struggling it, so struggling with it. So I went to the one person I can count on, that was my mother. And I asked her if Santa Claus was real, and she reassured me that not only is he real, but if I stop believing, he may not come. And so she could see that I was struggling. So a few days later, while we were on Christmas break, she took me and my little sister to Sears department store to visit Santa Claus. And man, I got to sit on his lap. I got to talk to him, told him what I wanted. And after that, I was convinced that he was real. So come Chris, uh, Christmas Eve uh, night, uh, you know, I wanted to go to bed early. I wanted, I was excited to wake up for Christmas. So I was the first one to go to bed and I went to bed about eight o'clock. I think my mother was very grateful for that. We did have company over that, that night. And uh, so I went to bed and come Christmas morning, I was the first one up. It was so early that it was still dark out. Now, Santa Claus did something a little bit different at our house than he did at everybody else's house. Instead of putting the presents under the tree on Christmas Eve, he would put them under our beds. So when you woke up, everything that was under your bed was yours. You didn't have to wait for everybody else to wake up. You didn't do all that stuff that, you know, a lot of other families do. So on Christmas morning, I jump out of bed, land on all four. I look under my bed and there's nothing there. And so I was thinking it was still kind of dark. Maybe Santa pushed them a little too far back. So I jumped up, turned on the light, came back and there's nothing. So I look over at my brother's, under my brother's bed. He was asleep right across from me and nothing under his bed. So we go to our other brother and sure enough, nothing. So then we go downstairs 
and we wake up our sisters. We, I had two sisters and sure enough, they have nothing under their bed. So there we are standing in the living room trying to figure out why Santa didn't come, at least I was. And my oldest brother suggested that I go wake up my mother. So I go into my mother's room and, you know, back then my dad was not a morning person. So you did not want to wake him up in the morning. So I tippy toe around the bed, go to my mother's side. I try to wake her up. She starts waking up and I tell her Santa didn't come. And all of a sudden her eyes just widen like a deer in the headlights. And she jumps out of bed and tells me, go into the living room and wait for her there. So I go into the living room and she comes out and then she tells us all to go into the kitchen and she tells us not to move. So I hear her go up the stairs, upstairs, and uh, I hear the attic door open. And then I hear all this noise. And so I did what any eight year old kid would do when their mother tells them not to leave the kitchen. I left and I peeked upstairs and there's my mother pulling out all the presents out of the attic and putting them under our beds. And she wanted to come down and tell us that, you know, we didn't look good enough that the presents are there, but you know, I didn't buy that. So going up the stairs, my older brother, Sam told me that, uh, I'm old enough to learn the truth now that there is no Santa Claus and our mom and dad is Santa Claus. Later that evening, my mother did explain the Christmas story, but her knowledge of the Bible is very limited. And it's basically what everybody else knows that Jesus was born on Christmas Day. And I'll tell you, Christopher, for the next 30 years, like I told your viewers yesterday, I believed in God. I believed that Jesus was the son of God. I believed that he died on the cross for my sins. But the problem was, God was like Santa Claus to me. Uh, as long as I felt I was living a decent life, I was okay with them. I was in good standing with them. And even my prayers resemble that of Santa Claus. All my prayers up until I found out the truth was always asking for things. Never praising him. It was just always a list of what I wanted. And when, I, when the light bulb finally went off of what it means to really be a follower of Christ, I shared that story yesterday. I was on fire to share the gospel with people. I, I had the perfect job. My job, I was a marketing rep. I would go visit insurance agents five a day. And out of the five a day, I would probably witness to two or three of them every day. And after witnessing to a couple hundred people, I come to realize that 80% of the people I witnessed to believed in God believed what I believed, but they were not in good standing with God. They were just like me before I figured out the truth of what it means to be an authentic follower of Christ. And that's why I wrote my book. I mean, I want to wake people up because we are entering the end times and I want people to wake up and understand what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. Because I think that most Americans, their view of God is kind of like Santa Claus. Now, they won't admit that, and I would never admit that when, when that was my view of God. But when I evaluated God, he was like Santa Claus. Wow. That's, um, that's a really awesome way to put it. And when you said what you just said, it jogged a memory in my mind that I'm not sure if I've explained to the viewers um, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Maybe some of our loyal viewers that have watched uh, me from the beginning knows this. But our show started in December. We've been, we're in our, approaching our fourth month. Uh, we haven't been at this long. For the last 25 years, give or take a few months, I've done uh, wedding photography and filmmaking on an extraordinary level where you know, all you have to do is Google my name. There's no shortage of information out there on me just because I hold many of the world records for most weddings shot at like 2,600 weddings. And, with you know, I, I'm saying all this to explain what I'm going to explain next, where Every week, it was a different wedding in a different country with, with a different celebrity. It got to the point where I stayed booked out for almost two years in advance, and I could literally handpick the clients that I wanted to pick because I turned away 80% of my inquiries because I stayed so far booked out. 
last year, about the beginning of the year, I, you know, the Lord started to tell me it was time for a change. And by the time summer came along, I knew it was time to serve him. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no plan. I just knew that it was time to serve him. Now, keep in mind, for the previous 25 years, I, I was an earner in the, you know, the very, very small bracket of percentages. Um, I won't give a number, but uh, my earnings were, were very impressive, even to a doctor or a CEO, just because if anybody has done anything with weddings, you know how expensive weddings are. And, you know, when I worked, I charged roughly $25,000 for the week to cover their wedding, and I didn't really have any overhead expenses. It was just my time. But I stopped accepting weddings uh, last summer. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I just stopped accepting weddings. So the, the rest of the year started to play out and I was still finishing the weddings that I committed to. And come about early December, late November, you know, my wife started to get really concerned because a large, actually a big part of our income was the deposits from these mega weddings that would cover our expenses and you know our lifestyle uh, she was very used to having a uh, a lavish lifestyle and i started to really get a lot of slack from her because come late november you know i hadn't really been earning much except just earning the balances of the weddings that i was shooting but uh, a large percentage of the payments of these weddings were made up front just a small percentage was paid at the end when I shot them because it, I required most of the money up front so that they were really committed to my time for that week. Otherwise, if you didn't get that commitment from them on that level, they could change things as you got closer and then the likelihood of filling that spot would be uh, very difficult. So, you know, it's four or five months had gone by since I decided to leave my industry and things were starting to get tight. I was getting slack from the wife, my parents, and a lot of folks that I know were like, what are you doing, Christopher? You're throwing away um, your career. This is what you were meant to do. And I, I get all that. I had been doing it a long time and was the gold standard of my industry. But, you know, God had put in my heart over that summer that it was time to exit and that he would take care of me. And we got down right to the wire where the bills that were coming up we're not going to get paid unless something happened. Just because the money that we were making, I always put that money into various different investments and I didn't sit on the cash. That's stuff I could always liquidate if I had to, but the cash cash was running thin, you know, for living expenses and, and paying what bills we had. So, you know, naturally the wife is about to lose her mind just because you know, she normally could go to the store and do whatever she wanted, and now she can't. And then out of the blue, me and Greg launched our show. And in the same week, a gentleman that had known me for a long time and followed my career offered me uh, a job at where I'm at now, essentially um, – doing something very, very incredible in an industry that is just incredible. Something that I had no experience doing, but he was confident that I could do it. So in the same week, everything fell together. Our show launched and I got a, an incredible job at, in, in a business that was an incredible opportunity. And in the first 30 days, our show went from zero to subscribers to 5,000 subscribers. And then in the following month, it was at 10,000 subscribers. And the same with the business that I, the gentleman I had come to work for, 
I have flourished extremely well there, um, helping all the operations. And now we're at the point with the show where the show is drawing enough revenue where if I needed to, I could live independently off of this. But if I would have thrown in the towel early, let's say in November and just went and started accepting weddings again, none of this would have happened. And the moral of my story is that I feel like I'm here to witness to the masses, to, to help guide folks through the deception. And it's, it's just a story of faith. Yeah. Most everybody else told me I was crazy for what I was doing. Um, I gave up a lifestyle that most people would dream for. But all of that material and money really meant nothing to me anymore. It, for me, it all meant serving the Lord. And that's where I would be paid is in his glory and what I'm doing for him. And what I'm doing now, even though it's a, a, it's pennies in comparison, I'm happier than I ever been in my entire life. So, well, you know, well, that's, Christopher, a, that's a story no one, in a nutshell. No one, <laughs> well, you know, no one has ever laid in their deathbed thinking, if I only would have worked a little bit harder, if I only would have made a little bit more money. The two biggest regrets is if I only would have spent more time with my family or if I only would have spent more time in God's word. Those are the two biggest regrets on the deathbed. I told myself a long time ago, I'm not going to have those regrets. And I am going to do God's will. And, you know, the last commandment Jesus gave us is to spread, spread the word. And I think for the most part, Christians are doing a horrible job at sharing the gospel. Yeah, I, and, and my thing is this, is I feel compelled uh, to do this. I have a a really a massive drive to help the community. Uh, for folks that know me well in the community know that I essentially do our show 24-7. doesn't matter if you message me at 2 o'clock in the morning or 10 a.m. in the morning, you'll get a response out of me. If you need help on our platform or you need a prayer request or you're having an issue with anything, um, pretty quick to respond. So uh, I'm compelled well, I think to help the community. And I, I, I actually enjoy the interaction with everybody that's in our community. And it, it's, it's interesting to think about it in retrospect as – I spent most of my life doing what I did because of financial earnings. And now that those things are, are really irrelevant to me. I know that's hard for some folks to wrap their head around, but I can't help how I feel. Once you really have the Holy Spirit working in you and you have that personal relationship with Christ, Things will naturally shift and change. Stuff that you worried about before, you know, stuff that you worried about having to do this to please him or do that to please him or to follow this rule, that stuff it becomes irrelevant because you will naturally walk in his path and do his will without even having to try because that personal relationship with him he becomes a part of you and starts to help with your decisions and your desires and your wants. So it's, it's, it's actually been incredible. And there has not been a time yet since our show launched where I was not able to make ends meet one way or another. It, he always came through somehow, some way, if we were close to the wire and, you know, a big bill was due, randomly I would get a message and someone wants to donate $3,000. And I'm like, wow. You know, I, I would say a prayer the night before and I'm like, kind of getting tight, Lord. Um, not sure what to do. And literally I would wake up the next day with someone wanting to donate us money. And it's just, it's, it's incredible how it works. 
It, it truly is. Have, for for me, it's just all about faith and trust. Oh yeah. Have, have you ever seen the movie uh, The Rookie with Dennis Quaid? You know, that's not the first time someone's asked me about that. I don't think I have. It's based on a true story. It's where uh, he Dennis Quaid plays a, a school teacher in Texas. And he was in college baseball and he hurt his arm and he stopped playing, but he kept throwing after his arm healed. Uh-huh. And uh, he was coaching some uh, high school baseball kids and he pitched for the kids and they couldn't believe how fast he could throw and, and they encouraged him to go try out. And he's like in his early forties. So he goes, tries out and you know, he gets, uh, he gets, um, what do you say? He gets hired by the Texas Rangers, but he's on the, you know, the minor league trying to work his way up to the pros and he's struggling because he's barely making any meat and he's trying to figure out what to do. So he goes, sees his dad and his dad was this tough old guy and really didn't like him playing baseball. But he asked his dad, you know, what do you think I should do? And he said, look, it's okay to do what you want to do until it's time to do what you were meant to do. Now, his dad meant it like to be a teacher, but he went on, he got, he became a professional baseball player, made several million dollars. I think he only pitched for two years, but he did great. But the reason I share that story, look, it's all great for us to do what we want to do, but I think we're coming to the time where we need to start doing what we were meant to do. And that is to be authentic followers of Christ and to share the gospel with those who don't know Christ. That's what we were meant for. Yeah, it, it's, and I have found, though, once you really, truly have that personal relationship with him, you want to. It's not a matter if you do or don't. You have a burning desire to do it. Uh, I still turn yeah. away work every week because I did my wedding stuff for so long my wedding website is still up anybody can google my name christopher brock photography it just it saturates the internet um you'll find the overwhelming amount of information about me in that area but my phone still rings um several times a day folks still trying to book weddings just because when there's you know two thousand plus weddings plastered on the internet for the last two decades they're not going anywhere so regardless of uh, I've been out of the industry since uh, last summer. It, it still hasn't slowed down anything. And I have no interest in doing that anymore. I, uh, uh, I literally turn away the work several times a day, even when I know that I could use that money to live more comfortably I ask myself, it's not really a matter of living more comfortably. It would just give me more money to to buy more material things or, you know, buy another car, stuff that I really don't need. You know, uh, I would rather put that time in with my kids. Um, I'd rather put that time in with the community. And that's been my motivating drive behind everything so it's all for me it's all about the community you know uh, building the community in christ because things are coming things are coming and the community will be the most important aspect of your life there will be no choice about it and for me uh I'm here to make sure my kids are safe and don't have to live in fear. So the community building is extremely important to me so I can protect them from those fears. So it's, you know, it's something you guys have to think about and plan for. But for me, the community is very important. Even though a lot of you that, you know, I talk to every day that you may be, thousands of miles away, we're still connected. And what's and ironically enough, a lot of the folks that are part of our community, some of them have put their houses up for sale and are moving out here 
where we are building our community locally. Um, that you know, we had Shane on the show a few nights ago, who is that uh, security guy in Texas and a dog trainer. He's always said that he would never leave Texas, but now he's selling his stuff in Texas and moving out this direction. It's just, it's incredible how things just come together uh, when you have mm-hmm. Christ involved. Uh, I absolutely agree. So what else would you like to tell us about your book? I'm sure you have uh, just really awesome stories and reasons for why you put it together. I'd love to hear more. I'm sure the community yeah, would love to as well. My book, it's called uh, Time is Running Out. Am I Really in Good Standing with God? Now, 80% of the book is based on am I really in good standing with God? And then 20% of the book is based on time is running out where I use scripture to show you that I believe we are the generation that's going to see the return of Christ. Uh, There's only five chapters, but it is 200 pages. uh, And I'll go through the chapters why I only have five chapters. So chapter one is called waking up to the truth. That's where you wake. We need to wake up and realize who God really is. And then I share the Christmas story. That was the morning I woke up to the truth about Santa Claus. And then I tie it into waking up to who God is and talk about God the rest of the chapter. Chapter two is changing the road I'm on. Once we wake up, we are on a narrow road now. It's a new road where things change. You're not the same person anymore. I talk about how what that road looks like, some of the obstacles that you're going to come across that road and, and how to stay on the road. Chapter three is called relationships, where I talk about, you know, uh, what it is to have a relationship with God. Because once you get on the narrow road, you spend the rest of your life building a relationship with God. And then chapter four is kingdom minded. Once you have a strong relationship with God, your focus shifts from an earthly minded focus to a kingdom minded focus. And, you know, our thoughts and uh, future thoughts should be kingdom minded. And then chapter five is time is running out. And like I said, that's where I talk about end time stuff. So basically, yeah. it's a process where the chapters are set up. Yeah. And, and- you know, I did. Get, I'll tell you, Christopher, when I first wrote the book, I wasn't sure about it. And I started getting a lot of positive feedback, you know, because, you know, I'm my worst critic. And uh, I had somebody about a month ago post uh, a review that I do not know this person. And the person put, it should be required reading for all Christians and non-Christians. So that made me realize that, yeah, this book, this message needs to get out. Yeah. Um, That's that's really neat. I'm going to uh, add the book on our social media platform um, I'm going to put a link in our store where people can buy it. Um, I feel like everything happens for a reason. God is putting his chess pieces in place. And it is just, it's our role to just support his moves. And Frank in the chat really said it best. He says, if you're anything like me, you think about it, that's all you think about. And that's true. It, it is really all I think about. When I get up, if I'm not dealing with the kids, I am, I'm, 